Um, so th th sometimes things line up. There's the, the skies align. In this case, the planets align. On uh, next week, a fleet of spacecraft is going to be hit, is landing, hopefully landing on Mars. And it's, you know, we've got some local um, talent in this area, not for landing on Mars, but for doing the radio part of things. Um, uh, Joe, uh, K6SAT, um, is a member of the club. He's been um, doing a number of things like uh, running the Western States radio side of things. But in his, in his backyard, he's got, well, Joe, is that, a, is that part of your backyard? Uh, this no, is the ultimate, no. <laughs> the ultimate DX. Uh, Joe, take it away. Okay, great. So um, uh, really happy to be talking about this. I obviously, um, it's a hobby, um, so I, I enjoy talking about it. Um, if people have questions along the way, just uh, somehow get my attention. Um, so um, this is called Ultimate DX, and um, it's referred to as Amateur DSN, and I'll, I'll uh, explain what DSN means in a moment. Um, so I'm K6SAT. Um, I'm also known as USA SATCOM, and uh, that is my Twitter handle. And uh, so if you're ever interested in what's going on in the world of deep space networks, um, that's where you would find out uh, is on Twitter. So let me get going. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background and then uh, define what amateur DSN is and then talk about my uh, experience in doing amateur DSN. And so that'll be what hardware is used, software, um, kind of what I've done um, since the 1990s um, in that regard. And then we'll talk about, um, you know, not just tracking uh, and detecting, but also uh, decoding uh, signals. And then as Greg mentioned, uh, there's a lot of activity uh, happening at Mars this month. And so we'll talk uh, uh, what that, what's happening and when that's happening. And then um, as with everything, um, it's a journey. And uh, so I'll talk about uh, some improvements to uh, my station over time. Okay, so, um, so I'm, I'm an engineer um, and um, became an engineer uh, back in 1988. Um, I have a background in uh, computer engineering and also space communication, which um, has come in pretty handy uh, for this hobby. And I've been a ham since the uh, late 1990s. Um, my interest beyond uh, satellites and spacecrafts uh, is uh, endurance running and, and mountain climbing, and, and that occupies uh, the rest of my, my time outside of, uh, of this. Okay, so DSN. So DSN is an acronym that uh, NASA came up with. It's called Deep Space Network. And uh, it's a bunch of uh, very large dishes uh, located across the uh, globe. Um, and in particular for US, that is uh, in places like Madrid, uh, Goldstone on the West Coast uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and also uh, in Australia. And if you if you look at those places on the globe, you can see that um, no matter where a spacecraft is, um, one of those areas of the Earth will be able to see that spacecraft. So it gives 24 by 7 coverage to spacecraft because um, obviously of the the orbital um, mechanics of things. So um, there's a European network, it's called ESA, uh, European Space Agency. Um, frequencies of interest here are, are rather high. Um, so, you know, we're familiar with uh, maybe 2.4 gigahertz, uh, your microwave oven or uh, ham radioactive uh, activity. Um, deep Space Network starts at about 2.2 gigahertz. Uh, then it bumps up to 8.4 gigahertz, and then it jumps up into the uh, KA band. Uh, 26 and 32 gigahertz. I'm active on 2.2 and 8.4. And so we'll talk more about that. So what is amateur DSN? It, it's really just trying to do what NASA is doing, but um, using amateur equipment, software, and, and skills. And you'd be very surprised what you're able to do without having a 70 meter dish in your backyard, which I don't have. Um, obviously detecting the presence of space probes, uh, very weak signals, um, but you're able to do things like measuring Doppler signal level, um, lock times, unlock times. I'll talk about what that is. 
Um, and in some cases, when the spacecraft's close enough or the signals, signals are strong enough, you can actually decode the signal and extract content. Um, in terms of a, a, a people out there that do this, there's about a thousand people worldwide. Um, there's a groups.io uh, if you're ever interested in doing something like this. So that's what um, I'm going to talk about. Um, this is what my wife thinks I do, uh, watch paint dry. Um, many times when you're looking for signals, um, you see nothing. You see white noise. And uh, white noise is an empty waterfall, uh, which this is a picture of. However, in some cases, that empty waterfall actually has signals in it. And with enough processing uh, software-wise, you can actually bring out a signal. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, professional ground stations, as I mentioned, are worldwide large antennas, um, actually up to 70 meters in size. Um, they're sometimes arrayed together, so combined. Um, you're aware of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, one of the early uh, US-based spacecrafts that are headed outside of our solar system or are already outside of our solar system, um, really, really far away. Um, they need to uh, combine multiple large, large dishes to even receive a signal from those nowadays. So um, Goldstone is the local uh, DSN um, area here in the United States. So I spent a lot of time looking at what they're doing because uh, that helps me in, in what I'm doing. So again, very large dishes, 70 minute meters. Um, my dishes are about three meters in size. So big, big difference. Okay, um, so um, I put in the next few slides for uh, Rob for uh, KM6 YKX. Um, we had a discussion the other night about the importance of uh, uh, frequency accuracy and locking radios um, to uh, GPS uh, or other forms of, um, of clock synchronization. So why is this important? Um, it's important because you, you need to be able to figure out where the spacecraft is. And figuring out where the spacecraft is means um, knowing what frequency it is on at a specific time. And, and really the only way to do that is to be able to um, have precise clocking so that you know exactly what the frequency is. So there's things like rubidium clocks, cesium clocks. Um, in the amateur world, you can actually get those nowadays off of eBay without spending too much money. Um, I use GPS clocking, so um, GPS uh, disciplined um, oscillators. That allows me to get uh, precise timing. Um, some of the equipment looks like this. Um, it, it, it's not just telling you where you're at. It's not just telling you what time it is. It's giving you a very precise 10 megahertz sine wave, which you can use to lock your radios to. And so the amateur equipment uh, for clock uh, thinking looks like this. A uh, small little uh, module takes in and plug in a GPS antenna, run some software, tell it the frequency that you want to generate. And it's now uh, very, very accurate, um, enough to be able to lock and detect weak signals. So a little bit about the, uh, the uh, deep space network sites. Um, so ESA sites, um, big, big dishes. You've probably seen them in various places in your travels. Um, NASA has the uh, equivalent give you an idea of, um, of these things. Um, when you uh, look at the specifications, um, you really need to put this in perspective. Um, so uplink power, um, if you're familiar with dB watts, 116 dB watts, um, when they put out a transmit signal, they're measuring it in tens of thousands of watts. Um, they just installed a new one, so 80,000 watts into an antenna that is 30 to 70 meters in size. So you can imagine it's a very, very strong signal, which is needed because the spacecraft is so far away. So how big of a dish do you need in order to decode a signal? Um, the largest semi-amateur dish that I'm aware of is a 20 meter dish. And it is able to pick up um, a spacecraft that is, um, fairly far out there, um, all the way to Mars, uh, but 20 meters is a fairly limited uh, size. You would be able to decode uh, narrow band signals, decode uh, telemetry and things like that, but not really data. So I wanna point out something here with this, um, this slide. So 
Um, the waveform that you see there in green is the, the signal coming from the satellite. And if you have a big enough dish, that's what you would see. What I see most of the time is in that little white dot, dotted circle. I just see a little line at the top, what's called the residual carrier. And, um, and so when we say we detect a spacecraft and it's you know hundreds of millions of kilometers away, we're normally talking about just the very tip of the uh, signal as you see in this diagram, whereas a 20 meter dish or larger would see the whole signal. So uh, NASA has a, uh, a website, it's called uh, eyes.nasa.gov. If you go there, um, you'll be able to see uh, the complete US based uh, DSN network and see which dish is talking to which spacecraft um, all the time and they're always active. Now, this particular website um, doesn't really give you enough information to be useful, um, but if you, you know a little bit about programming, underneath it, there's a bunch of XML data, which um, has the precise data. And so what us, uh, some of us amateurs have done is basically taken the XML data and created our own application that um, extracts all the information. Why is this important? Um, because when NASA is talking to a particular spacecraft, the residual carrier gets weaker. And so that may be why one is not detecting it at a particular time. So knowing when NASA is talking to a spacecraft is very, very useful um, when you're trying to detect something. So my particular station, I just want to give you a little background of what I have here um, and what I use. So I have um, a three meter dish that I use for uh, X-band and that's the 8.4 gigahertz. I have a 2.3 meter dish, uh, which I use for uh, S-band. And obviously I'm able to move these um, around. So I have azimuth and elevation control. Um, I have a couple different um, commercial and amateur um, uh, azimuth elevation systems. Generally it's accurate down to about 0.1 degree. And that's also very, very important. And I'll talk about why that's the case. Um, GPS uh, uh, disciplined oscillator, I already talked about for frequency accuracy. Um, and then receivers, um, you'll find that there's a mix of uh, SDRs as well as analog receivers. Um, and the data rates on those vary um, from very narrow to very wide, depending upon what's happening. And then a lot of custom software. Um, when I uh, went to college, you know, I got a, a degree in computer engineering, which is kind of half of an EE and half of a computer scientist. And um, I spent most of my time working on hardware. After I graduated, I worked on software. So I spent a lot of time developing software apps to enable most of this stuff in the amateur community. Um, so this is a, a very busy chart, but um, it, it basically shows all of the different hardware and software components that are necessary in order to uh, receive a deep space um, signal. So um, you need software to know where to point your antennas. And um, that software um, links into a database that NASA maintains on um, kind of like orbital elements for a satellite, but it's a little bit different for space probes. And you can query that system and get um, coordinates that you can then use to point to the spacecraft. And then of course you need a, um, uh, a low noise amplifier. You need something to convert from X band down to something that a normal radio would be able to tune. And then you need some way to look at the waveforms. And so a lot of software, a lot of hardware, a lot of it linked together, a lot of it custom, not necessarily off the shelf stuff. Um, give you a kind of an example of um, what some of it looks like. You may recognize some of it. Um, you know, there's a, um, uh, in the upper left there is a controller for moving the dish, right? So there's an elevation and azimuth and the computer will tell it where to go and the dish moves. Um, right next to that on the right, is a, um, a GPS receiver, and that's what is generating the precise clocks that um, essentially synchronize all of the radios and all of the SDRs. Um, directly below that, um, you can see an AOR, um, uh, AR2300. So that is a black box receiver that goes um, from basically DC to three gigahertz. And that's used to monitor the IF of a low noise uh, block amplifier, which is used to convert from X band down to L band. And then uh, of course you've got a lot of RF, um, you need to switch that RF. So there's some relays involved and then uh, some SDRs, which are the uh, last two pictures on the lower right. And um, the SDRs are 
generally uh, not the kinds of things that you would use in the amateur world, like um, you know an RTL dongle. Um, these are a little bit higher end um, because they need to be synchronized um, with a reference clock for, for accuracy. So that's kind of the electronic side of things. So, so what's in the shack and what's outside of the shack um, is a lot of hardware and plumbing. Um, so in the upper left there, you can see me building my three meter dish. Um, I, I've got a rivet gun and I'm putting screen up on the uh, skeleton of a three meter dish. Uh, that took about three months to build um, in, in terms of putting everything together and um, getting it all tuned up. Um, in the upper right, uh, I'm sorry, the upper middle uh, diagram, um, it looks like copper plumbing. Um, well, that's exactly what it is. It's copper plumbing. It happens to be UK uh, 28 millimeter um, copper pipe. And um, it is essentially a waveguide for uh, X-band. And um, if you're familiar with um, uh, wave band or uh, waveguides uh, and, and two and, and 1.2 gigahertz stuff for ham radio, you may be familiar with a VE4 MA uh, feed horn. And that's what's used here. And that's uh, the, the copper um, image that is right below this. I think my mouse, I'm pointing to it here. So this is essentially the feed horn on the, um, on the X-band receiver. Um, you can see these, um, little blocks of plate here that are copper blocks, that's called a depolarizer. So um, all of the spacecraft signals are circularly polarized. So you have to uh, match your feed horn with the proper polarization. Uh, back here is an LNB. This is uh, going from eight gigahertz to, to uh, L-band. Um, precision is very important for weak signals. And so um, one of the big things, and you probably may have heard me talking on the repeater a few times with, um, with Brian um, about getting things aligned. And you can see here, I, I've printed up on the 3D printer, a little holder, got a little, little uh, boresight laser there that's pointing at the other end of the dish, making sure that my feed, feed, horn, feed platform is aligned to the very center of the dish. And of course, that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, is um, when I point it to the sun, am I tracking the sun? And you can see the shadow of the feed in the center of the dish here in the lower right-hand corner. Um, that tells me, yep, I'm tracking the sun. Things are pretty well aligned. So a lot of time in getting that um, up to par. Um, the next step in uh, measuring performance before you actually try to use this um, is to, um, point your satellite uh, um, or your, your uh, dish towards the cold sky. So like uh, astronomers would do um, perhaps with their uh, uh, imaging, um, take a temperature reading uh, on the radio spectrum um, and then you would point the dish towards the sun and then you would measure sun noise. And the difference between those gives you the uh, capability or performance of your system. Um, for a three meter dish, um, I was measuring about 11.4 dB of sun noise uh, at eight gigahertz. And um, that's not bad, that's pretty good um, performance. And so that gives you an idea of what kind of capability that you'll have when you actually point this to a spacecraft. One interesting thing is look at the beam width here, 0 0.83 degrees, okay? So, it, and you have to realize that, you know, you, you, so you might say, okay, well, you have about one degree pointing accuracy. Well. It's about half that um, when you look at where the signal is within the dish and the efficiency of the dish. So uh, about 0.4. So if you're 0.4 degrees off of the spacecraft, you won't necessarily see it. That's how important the pointing is. Now that's with a three meter dish. Could you imagine a seven meter, a 70 meter dish? Huge, they deal with 0. 0.000 numbers. <laughs> anyway. Pointing accuracy is very uh, important. So um, this is the S-band dish. Um, so this is lower in frequency. This is 2.2 um, gigahertz. And um, you may be familiar if you were to construct a, a feed, a very simple feed is a helical feed um, that you can make in your garage. That's exactly what I did. And then mount that on the, the, the dish and you can get signals coming from the moon. Um, Here's an example. Remember I said what I see um, is just the tip of the signal. So here's that same signal, but my dish um, pointed to a spacecraft called Stereo A, 
which um, is um, essentially um, between the earth and the sun. And it is um, used for looking at um, uh, solar activity and, and, and solar plumes and things like that. So it's actually a very strong signal, but I still only see the very uh, tip of the signal. Um, so let me move on a little bit here. So um, here's my dish after constructing it, pointing at Mars. So I took a little snapshot of it. And in the upper right-hand corner um, is what the uh, waterfall looks like. So I'm, I'm simply monitoring the carrier from the spacecraft. And you can see that it paints a, a rather uh, curvy signal, right? And what's happening is, is um, we're getting Doppler. We're getting Doppler that is a result of the spacecraft um, as it moves around Mars and as the spacecraft moves relative to the Earth and as the Earth moves on its axis and as the Earth moves around the sun, all those things contribute to Doppler. And so it's very easy to see that you're pointing to a real signal versus not a real signal because not a real signal uh, does not have Doppler, right? So if it has Doppler, uh, it is a spacecraft. And so you, you get signals that look like this. And so very easy to determine that they're real. And of course you can point the dish away from the uh, satellite or the spacecraft and the signal disappears is a very good sign that it's coming from that location. You may have seen that in the movie Contact, right? When they picked up the signal, they moved it away, moved it back. Um, so that's a common uh, technique. So I've written some software that um, also does Doppler compensation. And that's also very handy if the signal is very, very weak because you can correct for it and you can average it and then get additional uh, signal to noise ratio um, by doing that. Um, so in the software that, that I've written, um, I get a list of various spacecraft here and I can see uh, what direction they're in, the current elevation, the current frequency, um, when the maximum uh, elevation is going to be, um, the Doppler rate, um, all kinds of information here, including path loss. And look at that path loss. They're all in the 200s um, or more. So that's 200 uh, dB, 270 dB of path loss. So that's, that's the performance that you need to overcome in order to even see the signal. And so basically with this software, um, you point, you click your mouse on one of these spacecrafts and the antennas move, frequencies change, and then hopefully you see a signal and you get a little radar uh, view of the spacecraft. And of course, uh, me would be right here in the center. And so in this example, you can see I'm pointed to stereo A and you can see that I, it's 168 degrees uh, azimuth and 42 degrees uh, elevation wise. And, gives me all this information, light time. So how, how long does it take to go to the spacecraft and come back? In this case, 15 minutes. So really puts things into perspective of how far it is when you look at how long the signals take. Um, remember that display that I showed you of NASA doing stuff. When NASA starts communicating with a satellite or a spacecraft, you can start your timer. And if it's Mars, it's 21 minutes of uh, round trip delay. So I know in 21 minutes, the signal is going to move because that's how long it takes NASA's signal to get there and how long it takes for the spacecraft to react to it. So when I first started um, this back in 1998, um, I didn't have quite as much capability. Um, and so here's a few screenshots of the system there. You can see I have some uh, amateur radio antennas, um, a small little parabolic dish in the middle, which was used for uh, AO40, I think, at the time. Um, but that could also be outfitted and used to pick up uh, space probes. And back then, um, I picked up something called Lunar Prospector. And I think even Greg may have um, picked this up as well. I remember talking to him about it many, many years ago. Anyway, it's really hard to see in this diagram, but in the middle at the lower, where you see the little arrows pointing to each other, there's a very weak signal with Doppler in there. And that's an example of what you would see um, for a very distant spacecraft. Now, the same kinds of spacecrafts around the moon nowadays with a large dish are very, very strong signals. And so you wouldn't have any problem finding it. In fact, this is what the uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter looks like from the moon. If I was to point my dish at it, if the moon was up and I was to point it, this is the signal I would get. And um, it's quite a strong signal, not quite enough to decode, 
but you can actually see the data flowing. So I see much more of the signal than just the carrier. So that's on S-Ban. Here's uh, another example. ACE is another spacecraft. It happens to be at the L1 Lagrange point, which is a uh, kind of a, a special orbit that is between the Earth and the Sun. Um, and again, picking up a fairly strong signal and you can, you can see data there as well. Now these are easy targets, um, but how far have I picked up something? This is my record of the Juno spacecraft, um, which was in orbit around Jupiter. So that's 878 million kilometers. That's not the record. The record's held by a colleague of mine in the UK that has over a billion mile record. Um, notice the signal doesn't have much Doppler and that's because it, it's being compensated for and averaged. Only way you were able to see the signal since it was so weak was to do Doppler correction and then add the signal over and over and over again. So that's the most distant spacecraft. Um, the weakest signal um, looks kind of like this. This is from a, a, a spacecraft that is in orbit around Mars. And um, you see the very faint little line there. So that's watching paint dry. So that's when I'm staring at the uh, monitor and I'm searching around looking for the spacecraft signal and I find it. That's what it might look like if it's really weak. And that could take, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to find if it's there. I have a little screenshot of what NASA was doing at the time. And so if you look there, you can see uh, this is the Mars uh, orbiter. And so that's the MO10. And they were receiving this on one of their very large dishes at 100 and minus 130 dBm. That was the signal level. That's pretty weak. Um, and so it's, it's, it's much weaker for me, obviously, and that's what a weak signal looks like. All right, so decoding a signal. Is it possible to decode a signal when these things are so weak? Um, the answer is yes. And in fact, um, uh, more recently, uh, the Chinese launched, launched a uh, space probe that went to the moon, um, landed, uh, picked up a sample, uh, reconnected with the orbiter and came back to Earth and then dropped that sample off uh, in China. And um, this was a, um, a signal that I decoded, um, this over here in the green. Um, if you play with signals and you decode them, you, a lot of times you can't figure out what's in them. And so you, you get pictures like this and you can see that if you do enough analysis, these are uh, telemetry counters. And so these are numbers that are going up, 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 and then down, down, down. Anyway, this is a, a video that was uncovered um, in the data from the spacecraft. I didn't uh, decode this particular one, but um, I thought I'd share it. So I'm playing it right now. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see a little bit of flickering there. That's the solar panels uh, of the spacecraft um, as it's traveling towards the moon. Now, when this spacecraft got um, about two thirds to the moon, it got too weak for us amateurs to decode the signal anymore. And then it started looking like a, um, a uh, carrier again, like we'd seen in some of the other uh, pictures. Okay, let me uh, move on here. So um, here's another example. Um, the Discover spacecraft at the L1 Lagrange point. Um, this is um, an example where I was able to see the signal, but I'm not using my dish. Um, there's a 20 meter dish in Germany um, that AMSAT uh, um, Germany has, and they occasionally uh, pick up signals from space probes. They contacted me and asked me if I could write a decoder for it, and I said sure, and uh, I did, and um, wrote a, a decoder, um, got a bunch of telemetry files, and this is what a live signal looks like when you're decoding it. So again, this is a 20 meter dish, but this is a, a spacecraft that's pretty far out there. Think about that 20 meter dish is what was needed to decode the signal. So a three meter dish works with the moon, um, but not really beyond. Okay, so what's happening um, with Mars? So Greg mentioned um, a lot of spacecrafts uh, converging on Mars. Um, actually two have already arrived of the three. Um, the first one is the, uh, the EMM or the Emirates Mars mission. This is a, an Arab uh, satellite called HOPE that was uh, launched when the other two were launched and it arrived on February 9th and successfully inserted itself into Mars uh, orbit. Um, uh, the following day, um, the uh, TN-WIN uh, 
uh, orbiter uh, from China um, uh, successfully inserted into Mars orbit as well. Uh, that is an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. So they're currently in orbit, and sometime in May, they're going to uh, drop off a lander, and out of that lander is going to roll a rover. So they're going to do uh, what we've done in the past and rove around on Mars. So um, about six days from now, uh, Mars 2020, which is also known as uh, Perseverance, is going to land on Mars. So there's no orbiter. They're going to directly land. So they're coming from Earth. They're going to land directly on Mars. Um, they're going to dispatch a rover. And then on that rover is also a helicopter. Um, it sounds really strange that they're going to do all that at once, but that's what the plan is. So in six days, we will find out um, how that worked out. And as Greg mentioned, you know, um, historically, 50% chance of your spacecraft even successfully inserting into orbit. So we have two of three uh, spacecraft here in the last few days that have um, you know, exceeded expectations. So I hope the US is able to do the same. So um, here is the uh, picture of um, the EMM signal coming from Mars, um, picked up um, just three days ago. So this is a picture from my station here in Loomis uh, pointed to Mars. And this is what the EMM signal looks like as it is orbiting Mars. And I included in there a screenshot of what Goldstone was receiving at the time. So you can do the uh, signal comparison. Um, TNWIN-1 um, is a very, very strong signal. Um, you know, we the US has huge dishes and they can have spacecraft with very tiny signals. Uh, China does not have great big earth stations around the world like we do. And so they have their transmit power turned up quite a bit. So I can actually see data coming from Mars on good days. I can't decode it, but I can see it. And you can see it here in the pictures. You see all these uh, vertical bars. That's the uh, carriers in their data signal. And then you can see they turned it off and they went to a narrow band data signal that just looks like some hash. And then you see basically a carrier. So very, very strong signal. And I must say, <laughs> you, you only need a 60 centimeter dish to pick up this signal if you were interested in doing so. Um, this is what the signal looks like in real time. If you were to receive it, you can see the data um, off to the side of the carrier on either side. OK. Um, and then the, uh, the 20 meter dish in Germany, um, they were able to decode it. So all the way from Mars to Earth, this is such a strong signal that even a 20 meter dish was able to decode that signal. And I don't know if you've seen this, I just thought I would include it. This is not anything that an amateur picked up. This came from China, but this is the view from the uh, spacecraft as it arrived and inserted itself into Mars orbit. So you're going to see it shaking a little bit. It's breaking um, with a maneuver, and it is going into orbit. And I'm not sure why the US has not put cameras on spacecrafts like this um, for looking at orbital insertion, but it's quite interesting to watch. Um, at least I thought it was. So this is uh, um, obviously in orbit now, um, successfully um, um, there. OK, so um, more specifically about Mars 2020, which is still six days away. So turns out um, that had a strong enough signal that after it left the Earth on its way to Mars, that uh, amateurs were able to decode the signal coming from that spacecraft. And um, as Brian uh, mentioned on the uh, uh, net, uh, coffee break net a, a while back, he mentioned some Easter eggs. and. Uh, Easter eggs were present in the uh, telemetry signal from the spacecraft um, for amateur uh, DSN people like myself. And um, if you decoded the signal and you uh, looked there, you would find some plain text in the signal. And it was a list of all these people that uh, wrote code and developed the software for the spacecraft. And, um, and so that was pretty cool to uh, actually get uh, data that was intended for amateurs um, coming from the spacecraft itself. OK, Mars 2020. So I picked this spacecraft up today. 
um, it is an extremely weak signal. Like I said, NASA has huge dishes. Um, I have to use Doppler compensation and averaging to see it, but I can see it every day. And it was a pretty nice signal uh, today um, and obviously going to get weaker and weaker. Remember, it's not going into orbit. It's going to land. So it's only going to get weaker. Will we be able to see a signal from the, um, the um, surface of Mars? I don't know. Um, it'll be a stronger signal for sure, um, but you have to go through the, well, you have to go from the surface up. I was going to say atmosphere, but that would have been incorrect. <laughs> Okay, so a few things, and then I'm almost done here. Um, so when, when I'm looking for a signal and I don't see anything, there, there's a lot of reasons why that may be the case. The spacecraft may not be transmitting a signal. They don't always transmit signals. They conserve power, so they may not be transmitting. Some are, some aren't. Um, when they are sending data, um, the carrier may be too weak to receive. It can be reduced because it's sending data, which means someone is talking to it, like NASA or ESA or something like that. Um, we may not have up-to-date tracking data. Uh, not every spacecraft um, provides data. So remember the Japanese uh, space agency recently had a sample from an asteroid return to Earth and drop off uh, a sample in Australia. And uh, they uh, asked NASA to remove the uh, uh, spacecraft coordinates from their online systems so us amateurs could not detect it anymore. And of course, you know what happens when they do that. All the amateurs get really interested in tracking it. And so we found it anyway. And then we published our own coordinates of where it was up and where it was at. And, and we also decoded the signal from that as well. Um, again, as it gets close, it, it's, um, it's easy. Um, so a three meter dish with uh, pointing errors of 0.2 degrees, you can, you can completely miss a, uh, a signal. And when it rains um, here, because my dish is not on a, a perfectly level uh, system, um, I have to make minor adjustments, but I do that on a daily basis until I get the cement poured for it. Um, Doppler correction can enhance the signal. And then Doppler correction um, can be very, very complex. As I said, there are many aspects to contributing to Doppler. If you don't account for all of them, then when you average the signal, you get nothing. So you have to have all the math done correctly or you get nothing. Um, lastly, we're all trying to improve our systems. And this is uh, my next improvement. Um, this is a slewing system with um, accuracy down to 0.05 degrees, because uh, 0.1 is not good enough. Um, so 0.05 will give me the accuracy that will allow me to move up to 32 gigahertz, which has a much smaller beam width. So um, I was gonna do a demo, um, not a long one, but um, Mars is um, uh, under my tree line now. So I'm not able to do that. <laughs> that is uh, all I had for tonight. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. You Carl, you just brought up something. Are you heavily affected by the foliage around you? Yes, I am. Absolutely, yeah. The noise floor, the signals are always there. The problem is the noise floor sometimes is much stronger than the signal. Okay, and that's from, yeah, is that from the foliage or just everyone around you? Um, it's actually at XBAN, it is really just uh, living plants and trees. Um, it, it essentially generates heat that is visible at, at XBAN, um, which is why when we do the sun test, we point to the cold sky. Um, if we were to just keep it at ground level, even though it's not pointed at a signal, the noise floor you know, could be adding 5, 10, 15 dB of noise. And so it's just, um, you know, that's why they put these things out in the desert. Other questions? Yeah, this is Greg. Um, so aiming this thing, um, with my telescope, I have Polaris and offsets from that to aim yep. that within a few arcs. <laughs> How do you get- That's, that's a, a great, great question. question. <laughs> Aligned to something that's not yep. visible. Yeah, and let me and you know it's very very great a good question. So we have geosynchronous satellites, um, and the it happens to be that the military uh, also uses X band, 
and they use um, right below the DSN space network, um, which starts at about eight gigahertz, uh, the military uses 7.5 and up to eight. So, and they have lots of spy satellites and um, communication satellites, and uh, they're fairly well known where they're at because they're geosynchronous. So you simply point to one of those and you tune in their uh, telemetry um, uh, beacon and you peak your, your system. Now, even though it's at X-band, um, because it's such a strong signal, you, you're getting about a degree of accuracy there. So when I go and point to a spacecraft, there's still probably another half a degree of improvement in pointing that I can, I can get. And so my, my routine right now is as I point to the military satellite, I, I reset everything. Then I point to the Chinese uh, TUN um, uh, spacecraft at Mars. It's such a strong signal. It's 27 dB of signal strength over the noise floor. I can see it through the trees and um, I can precisely line down to about 0.4 degrees with that. And then I'm, I'm good to go at that point. Wow, that's, uh, that's yeah, so using the existing satellites, trying to get Oscar 40 years ago um, into my, I had like a, th a three foot dish, not meters, um, not even three foot, it's like a 30 inch. Um, I used the sun, mm -hmm. it was my only way of doing that uh, to try to get the thing aligned. And uh, that was close enough for it, but wow. Thank you, uh, any other questions? Joe, yeah, Joe, this is Brian. When yep. you are aiming at something that's so weak that you have to be combining and averaging, how do you yep. know that that's actually an object and not just? Um... Oh, great question. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you're not doing that, right, it having Doppler is a, is a dead giveaway, right? So, mm -hmm. so when you're doing Doppler compensation, it should be a straight line, right? So if it's a spur or if it's local interference, it's not it shouldn't normally have Doppler. So if I'm correcting for it, it should be a straight line. So if I'm correcting for it and it's not a straight line, I know it's not the spacecraft. Mm. And, uh, and then of course we do what we call the, you know, the contact maneuver, which is, you know, we will move the dish a half a degree, you know, in azimuth and elevation and the signal should disappear and then it'll come back when you repoint. And that's essentially how we know it. Um, the other, other way that we do it is, is we can look at what NASA is, um, what frequency it's receiving at for that spacecraft. And you can do math to determine that that matches the frequency of which you're seeing a carrier. Now, it's, it's actually not simple math. It's fairly complex because the Doppler adjustment that is made compensates for their uplink Doppler which is dependent on their latitude um, on Earth, right? Not mine. And, and so when we do Doppler compensation, all that has to go into the math. And if anything is off, you don't see a signal at all. Wow. Hey, Joe. Hey, Guy. Hey, what's your total investment in all of this? It looks uh, really <laughs> a lot. Do you get subsidized and then finally, how do you keep your wife from leaving you, buddy? <laughs> I, I, I have to plant flowers around the dish, but um, yeah, it, it, uh, over time, um, you know, this has been a lot of engineering over the years. Um, and I would say that, you know, I, I try to leverage a lot of uh, surplus equipment and then um, I write a lot of software and a lot of the hardware I do myself, you know, you saw the, the feed was plumbing, um, you know, and it's made out of copper, um, that's not anything that you buy. You have to make that uh, 3D printers for printing the, the frames and aluminum stock and um, a drill press. Um, you know, you do have to buy a receiver. Um, you do have to make sure that it's, um, you know, synchronized. Um, but there are a lot of um, modifications that are available in the amateur world for locking receivers. It's a lot of people who do weak signal work. Moon bounce, for example, um, they like their radios to be locked. And so um, you can leverage a lot from the amateur community for, for some of this stuff. How many amateurs are out there, uh, you know, that are doing to this level like yourself? Um, there's probably about five worldwide. Um, there's a couple in Europe, one in the UK, um, and then 
uh, one in South America, myself, uh, and one other person here in the, well, one person in the US, me, and then uh, one person in uh, Canada. Wow. Okay. Now there's a thousand people that are interested in doing it and have really small systems, but people that are active every day, it's probably about five or so. Wow. And um, we do get the attention of um, ground tracking stations and NASA and the ESA, um, you know, people whose job it is to manage those spacecrafts who are, um, you know, very happy to see that amateurs are able to, to do this work. So they sometimes acknowledge us on Twitter. Um, that's our main uh, outlet for some of this stuff. Okay, I see there was a question from Joshua Morris. Uh, Joe, uh, how much did it, your 3M dish build cost? Um, the, the dish itself was um, around $2,000 um, with about three months of labor. <laughs> so it was a kit form um, and um, it, it's very hard to get dishes of that size anymore that are not, um, you know, bent, uh, if, if that makes sense, right? So lots of surplus C-band dishes, but the mesh size is generally too, too big. So it won't work very well for, for X-band. They've been around in someone's backyard, so they're potentially dented or bent. And, um, and so I, I did not want to deal with any of those problems. And so I, I sourced a dish from overseas, but it was a kit. And then I had to build it. Hey, do you have to compensate for thermal expansion and contraction of the antenna and all the mechanical supports? Um, not so much, but one of the things that I've observed is, is that I get a, um, about a 0.4 to 0.5 degree of um, adjustments um, over the evening when I'm tracking a satellite. So as the um, elevation goes up, as the azimuth changes, as the elevation comes down, I have to put in some corrections. Um, sometimes I don't. And so for example, tonight, um, I didn't have to make any corrections, but um, when it was raining yesterday, um, I had to correct. Now that could have also been water content in the soil, which changed the, uh, the tilt of the system. And, and you got to remember, you know, just a minor tilt, <laughs> you know, can create a, a 0.1 or a 0.2 degree error. So it's very minor stuff. Um, but, but yeah, I, there is certainly atmospheric um, conditions that affect the uh, uh, signal and how it gets attenuated. Um, there's also uh, something called parallax. Um, there's the radio refraction that occurs uh, through the atmosphere, which is very odd, right? It, it's a well-known um, astronomy thing, but it, it also applies to radio waves. So when you're below about, oh, 20 degrees elevation, there's a, um, a 0.3 or 0.4 degree adjustment um, due to the refraction of the uh, RF signal through the atmosphere. Is there a time of day or a time of year because of uh, thermal, uh, therm uh, thermal noise? Uh, does that start coming into play for you? It does. Summer is not very good. Um, you know, obviously the thermal background noise goes up considerably because there's a lot more leaves and they're heating up, the ground's heating up. Um, all that's very bad for weak signal uh, work. So winter is your friend. Um, and the other thing that's your friend is the uh, orbits of the planets. And of course, from a seasonality perspective, how high elevation wise they get relative to you is important. The higher the elevation, the better signal to noise ratio you're gonna have and the less background noise that you have. Boy, playing with just regular amateur radio on VHF frequencies must uh, <laughs> seem so simplistic after uh, identifying signals that uh, you have to average, even know that they're there. Incredible. It, it keeps me busy for sure. And I learn a lot. Um, so I, I enjoy it and uh, like to talk about it, as you can tell. 